This video is sponsored by Squarespace. For any aspiring content creators or business owners, Squarespace is the best way to carve out a space of your own online. Whether you're just starting out or managing an existing brand, Squarespace provides everything you need to create a beautiful website to engage with your audience, sell products, host content, and much more. With Squarespace, you don't need to be an expert at writing code. Simply select from dozens of pre-made flexible templates. Once you've found one to your liking, Squarespace's Fluid Engine allows you to customize your site as much or as little as you want. You can also secure the perfect domain name with Squarespace's domain services as well. Follow the link in the description to start making your own website with your own domain name and use the promo code ROWANJCOLMAN for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you once again to Squarespace for helping me keep the lights on over here. And now, on with the video. In 2003, science fiction television was changed forever following the release of Battlestar Galactica. This reboot of the 70s original courted plenty of controversy from fans for its gritty style, grim tone, and character changes. However, its fresh approach to the sci-fi genre, mature and complex storytelling, and stellar performances won it great acclaim from critics and the undivided attention of a large and passionate fanbase. While its final season and ultimate ending were highly controversial, it was clear there was still plenty of appetite for Galactica stories. Thus, the end of the series wouldn't be the last we heard from this version of the Battlestar Galactica universe. Battlestar Galactica was a bona fide hit for Universal and the Sci-Fi Channel, but it was also a show which left some of its fans disappointed by its conclusion. However, the controversial ending of the series also presented the network and studio with an opportunity. In some ways, the backlash to the final episode was an indicator of lingering passion for the series, and so perhaps there was a way of giving fans what they wanted, while also adding to the Galactica series. Previously, the series had great success with the straight-to-DVD movie Battlestar Galactica Razor, a semi-prequel showing the destruction of the Twelve Colonies from the Pegasus' point of view, and showing a previously unseen mission where the fleet takes on a Cylon force left over from the original war. In some ways, Razor replicated the success the Sci-Fi Channel and MGM had had with a number of straight-to-DVD Stargate films, The Arc of Truth and Continuum. Therefore, it seemed logical to try the same model on their new hit series. To satisfy fans of the show without breaking the continuity of the series, the solution was to create a standalone film showing key events in the series from the Cylon point of view. However, the foundation for this concept was to be built on somewhat shaky ground. The only thing that sort of never quite added up, I think, for people or for us is that, you know, the, the, the opening title that says, and they have a plan, which I will never forgive David Icke for putting <laughs> into the show. You did it, David. We knew we were doing a show that was, to a degree, slightly Byzantine, slightly complicated, that was going to explore a lot of depth of mythos and, and get into some, some uh, areas that were going to be challenging. And we wanted to assure the audience that we weren't just screwing with them. So, and they have a plan was a way to do that. When we actually saw it in writing on the main title, I remember Ron and I calling each other and saying, are we sure we want to do this? It's really cheesy. And they have a plan. Production began on the 8th of September 2008, with most major cast members reprising their roles. Edward James almost directed the new scenes for the film, having previously helmed a number of episodes of the show. Because production was so close to the final season of the show, the plan was able to reuse all existing standing sets, as well as the usual locations around Vancouver. The post-production team was also the same as the series, with visual effects by Zoic Studios supervised by Gary Hutzel and music by Bear McCreary. A notable new track produced for the film was the song Apocalypse, a new arrangement of the theme used in the opening credits of the show. The song was performed live at San Diego Comic-Con as part of a wider performance of Battlestar Galactica's music. Over six months after the end of Battlestar Galactica, the plan was released on home video and aired on the Sci-Fi Channel the following January. 
As a standalone film, Battlestar Galactica The Plan has its moments, but overall feels very perfunctory. The idea of showing established events from the Cylon point of view is certainly an intriguing one, but it's a concept which isn't capitalised on outside of the opening act. Seeing the destruction of the Twelve Colonies in full, as opposed to largely off-screen as it was in the miniseries, is as spectacular as it is terrifying. The visual effects are top-notch, and Bear McCreary's music conveys the emotion of the sequence beautifully. It's a solid start to the film, but it largely peters out by the time the story catches up with the events of the actual show. The truth is, despite what the opening titles of the show say, the Cylons never really had a plan. What's the plan? The plan is, everything blows up a week ago. All the humans are dead, we Cylons all download, and the universe basks in justice. However... It didn't fracking happen. Mm, exactly. Now, I've recently gone over how this isn't necessarily a problem in terms of a creative approach to writing, but to have the characters state this explicitly is another thing altogether. Watching the characters engage in this scattershot campaign to take down the fleet is far from compelling drama. While there is an attempt to bridge the gaps in the narrative with theme, the plot ends up feeling disjointed and the pacing feels uneven. The plan's greatest flaw is that it adds so little of note to the story. Episodes of the show like Downloaded succeeded far more in showing the viewer the Cylon perspective, what the Cylons believe in, their culture, their drives and goals and so on. But there's little if any of that in the plan that we haven't already seen from the show. For the most part, the film is content to answer rather unimportant questions in the grand scheme of things. Most of the new scenes only exist to dramatise moments which we could intuit happened off screen during the show. Because of this, despite the efforts of the cast, who are all very strong, most of the material they have to work with is quite dull. Ultimately, the biggest problem with the plan is that it was simply ill-conceived, a project created to maintain a brand rather than tell a story, and driven by a creative team who didn't seem to have much interest in the concept to begin with. It fails to add anything substantial to the story of the show or these characters, beyond filling in a few background details. In the end, it's little more than a novelty. Although by most accounts the plan sold reasonably well on home video, reception was extremely mixed. The visual effects, music and performances were praised, but overall most fans opined that the plan didn't really do justice to the series it was built on. Despite the workmanlike production and lukewarm reception of the plan, Ronald D. Moore and David Icke were still keen on another BSG-adjacent project. The duo had bandied about the idea of a spin-off series as early as Battlestar Galactica's second season. However, Moore and Icke had no desire to make a sequel series, the ending of the show essentially making such a project untenable. At the time, there seemed to be a rather obvious direction to go in for a prequel spin-off, a series following a young William Adama set during the First Cylon War. Fans already had a taste of this during the flashback sequences in Razor, which were also expanded into a handful of webisodes. While Ronald D. Moore and David Icke were mulling over ideas for a spin-off, writer Remy Obishon, known at the time for his work on 24 and who would later work on Stargate Universe and Falling Skies, pitched a movie to Universal Pictures about artificial intelligence. While Universal didn't pick up his movie, they asked him to bring his ideas to Moore and Ike, who instantly took a liking to them. Soon the trio came up with a new concept, a prequel but one set far earlier on Caprica at its height, showing the birth of the Cylon race. It was in fact Ronald D. Moore who didn't want to do a prequel following Adama during the first Cylon War. He said, You don't try to repeat the formula. Everything about Caprica was designed specifically not to do what we had done in Galactica. While this was a surprising direction to take a BSG spin-off in for most fans, it did have a certain logic to it. A big part of Battlestar Galactica is the influence of ancient mythology. While Galactica drew from the epic quests of that mythology, Caprica was to be more akin to a Greek tragedy. Like Battlestar Galactica, the cast of Caprica was a healthy mix of established stars and young newcomers. Eric Stoltz and Issei Morales, both highly successful film and TV actors, were the marquee names to occupy the leads of the series Daniel Greystone and Joseph Adama, respectively. The supporting cast was made up of numerous veteran TV actors, such as Paula Malcolmson as Amanda Greystone, Sasha Royes as Sam Adama, Brian Markinson as Jordan Durham, and Polly Walker as sister Clarice Willow. 
Making up the younger cast was Alessandra Torresani as Zoe Greystone and Magda Apanowitz as Lacey Rand. Despite the terrestrial setting of Caprica, in some ways it turned out to be more visual effects intensive than Battlestar Galactica. While the production re-enlisted the talents of visual effects supervisor Gary Hutzel, the bulk of the work was done by an in-house team rather than Zoic Studios, who had worked on BSG. Not only did the Vancouver skyline need to be augmented with CG buildings, but many more CG environments were created for various other colonies like Toron and Geminon. The series also featured a number of virtual sets. The music was once again handled by Bear McCreary. For Caprica's score, McCreary eschewed some of the ethnic instruments used in Battlestar Galactica, instead favouring traditional orchestral instruments like piano, cello and even opera vocals. Following production on the pilot episode, Ronald D. Moore stepped away from the series, handing over showrunning duties to Jane Espenson, who had worked as a writer-producer on Battlestar Galactica. The series premiered with a feature-length pilot on the 22nd of January 2010. Experimentation is always something I commend, but Caprica is quite a baffling product. Pairing dynastic family drama with high-concept science fiction is certainly a unique combination, and under different circumstances, it's an idea which could have found a solid audience. But as the prequel to the massively successful Battlestar Galactica, it's most definitely the last thing fans of the show were expecting from a spin-off. Though that's not to say this subversion makes Caprica a failure by any means. The strongest aspect of the show is its world-building. The different cultures of the Twelve Colonies and the conflicts between them is something Battlestar Galactica often mined for some compelling drama. Thus, the world of Caprica and the Twelve Colonies in general feels lived in, grounded, and tangible. Immediately identifiable in the broad strokes, but thoroughly unique in the granular details. The Taurons in particular are very well developed. Small touches like their use of ancient Greek as their native language, symbolic tattoos and ceremonial daggers, it all adds up to a vision of a people which feels akin to any number of religious or immigrant communities one may see in any number of cities. But it's an element which also feels wholly part of this familiar universe. In terms of presentation, the visual effects are less consistently strong. The cityscapes and the Cylon prototypes hold up well, but the fully computer-generated sequences haven't aged as well. It works more as a stylistic choice during the scenes taking place inside a virtual reality, but during scenes set in what is meant to be the real world, it can be quite jarring. Like Battlestar Galactica, however, the cast is very strong. Eric Stoltz and Issei Morales comfortably deliver the most captivating performances of the show. The relationship between Joseph Adama and Daniel Greystone is what anchors the entire series. The Greystones walk in the upper echelons of society, rubbing shoulders with the most rich and powerful, whereas the Adamas occupy the underworld, maintaining ties with organized crime and street gangs. However, it's the Greystones and their world which seems to be the most cutthroat and brutal. The Greystones are repeatedly betrayed and backstabbed. In response, they will seemingly go to any lengths, say anything, do anything, not only to survive, but to triumph. The Adamas and the other Toron clans, on the other hand, maintain strict codes of honour. Alliances are often fragile, and their way of life has a certain brutality to it, but there are always lines they refuse to cross, even if it's to their detriment. The setup for the series actually has a lot of promise. The tragedy which links the Greystones and Adamas works very well as a catalyst to drive further conflict between the families themselves and within their respective worlds. Zoe and Tamara continuing to exist in virtual reality, their links to the monotheistic religion later adopted by the Cylons, and the rising tension of the Cylons slowly reaching sentience is all very engaging on a conceptual level, and in practice for the most part as well. However, at times Caprica struggles to sustain these plot threads. Almost every arc becomes stretched a little thin, necessitating a number of contrivances to undo some of their progress. A good example is Joseph Adama's struggle to move on from his daughter's death. He starts the series naturally broken by this loss, but a virtual duplicate simultaneously gives him hope she can come back, and also deepens his pain even more. It's okay. I'm right here. My heart is beating. I miss you. Daddy, my heart is beating. Why is my heart beating? Why is my heart beating? Why is it? <laughs> she 
couldn't feel her heart. She couldn't feel her heart. She'll she was... adjust. She's probably very confused by everything. It's only natural. No, no, it's not natural. No, it's, it's wrong. It's an abomination. But after much heartache, he accepts Tamara is gone. In a touching scene, the Adamas hold a funeral ceremony. Do you have a coin for me, Yosef? I have a coin for my sister, Tamara Adama. Will you grant them passage? They will have passage. Will you let them go? Will you bid them farewell? Goodbye, Tamara. Goodbye, Tamara. Featuring a reprise of Wonder My Friends from Battlestar Galactica's score, the emotional impact of the scene is keenly felt. However, this is soon undercut by Joseph discovering Tamara's virtual self has escaped into a popular sim game, which plunges him back into his grief as he struggles to find her, only for Tamara herself to push him away by the end. Essentially, the character arrives at the same place, but because of this reset, it feels as though Joseph's character is running in place for several episodes. This is an example which is illustrative of most of the plot threads in the series. Caprica would have certainly benefited from having a shorter first season. Despite those issues, however, the conclusion of the series is very strong. Polly Walker makes for a striking villain as Clarice Willow, in some ways echoing Deep Space Nine's Kai Wynn. Someone who puts up a nurturing, caring front, but only to hide a ruthless lust for power underneath. And in its final episode, the seemingly disparate elements of dynastic family drama, cyberpunk religiosity, and killer robot-infused crime thriller somehow works. And it's sentences like that which make it easy to see why Caprica developed such a vocal cult fanbase. Unfortunately, that fanbase wasn't big enough to sustain the series, and before Caprica wrapped its first season, the show was cancelled due to low ratings. Despite the small audience the show managed to reach, its cancellation was by no means a surprise. Experimentation and originality should always be encouraged and commended, but put simply, Caprica just wasn't what most Battlestar Galactica fans wanted out of a spin-off. It's a somewhat paradoxical piece of work. Caprica was a series which aimed to be totally different to Battlestar Galactica and appeal to a new audience. Yet, the main reason Caprica was made at all was due to its connection to Battlestar Galactica and that show's fanbase. As it stands, Caprica exists as a curiosity. Far more substantive than a novelty like The Plan, but less consistent than Battlestar Galactica. As a result, it's full of interesting ideas and characters, but hampered by contrived plotting and uneven pacing. Personally, I can appreciate the creative team behind Caprica swinging for the fences, but on this occasion, it was a swing and a miss. As Caprica was still airing its first season, Universal and Sci-Fi also began developing another Battlestar Galactica project, which was to be an episodic video game which followed a young William Adama during the First Cylon War. Though Ronald D. Moore was involved, the project was primarily developed by David Icke and Michael Taylor, who had previously worked on Battlestar Galactica as a writer-producer. Allegedly, Sci-Fi were so impressed by the finished script that they decided to shelve the video game idea and instead develop the project as a television show titled Blood and Chrome. In the leading role as a young William Adama was British actor Luke Pasqualino, known in the UK for the teen drama Skins, as well as the action-adventure series The Musketeers. Joining Adama on his first adventure was grizzled raptor pilot Coker, played by Canadian actor Ben Cotton. Completing the trio for the adventure was Hungarian-American actress Lily Bourdain as Dr. Becca Kelly. The supporting cast included a number of familiar faces from both Battlestar Galactica and Caprica. A familiar voice was Trisha Helfer, reprising her role as Number 6 for a brief scene at the end of the pilot. Production was once again based in Vancouver, Canada. However, the standing sets from Battlestar Galactica had since been dismantled. Ike and CG supervisor Doug Drexel had been toying with the idea of fully virtual production. Rather than rebuilding the physical sets used for Galactica, its interiors and most other locations would be fully computer-generated, something which Gary Hutzel and Doug Drexler had previously experimented with on Caprica. 
It was an incredibly ambitious idea, as at the time most TV shows only featured 75 to 120 visual effect shots per episode. Blood and Chrome, however, would end up featuring over 1800 visual effects shots. At the time, this number of shots wasn't even commonplace in big budget feature films. Almost every scene involved the actors on a green or blue screen set, with only a few props and extras for them to interact with. Perhaps due to Blood and Chrome's origins as a video game project, Universal and Sci Fi often flip flopped on the exact format Blood and Chrome would be released in. Initially, it was pitched as a web series. Battlestar Galactica had already seen success in this format with a number of webisodes which served as supplementary content for a number of episodes of the show. However, Blood and Chrome's larger budget seemed to warrant a traditional TV broadcast. But then again, it could have followed Razor and the Plan as another straight to DVD movie. In the end, Blood and Chrome was released as a 12 part web series in November 2012 on the now defunct Machinima YouTube channel. The following year, it aired on the Sci Fi channel and was later released on DVD and Blu ray. After the family focused drama of Caprica, which left many Galactica fans indifferent, Battlestar Galactica Blood and Chrome jumps back into the sci fi action for a fast paced adventure. The visual effects are incredibly impressive, especially for a television production of the time. The sheer volume of work on display made to this standard on this budget level is staggering. The only caveat is that much of that excellent visual effects work on display is eclipsed by a gluttony of lens flares. This was no doubt a conscious choice to help blend the live action computer generated imagery, but it does make certain scenes appear too visually busy, and the image ends up being too murky at times. The hangar bay scenes are probably the biggest offenders in this regard. However, with darker high contrast lighting, the effect works very well. Having seen the behind the scenes footage, it's surprising to learn just how few practical elements were on set. Luke Pasqualino and Ben Cotton make for strong leads as a dammer and coker respectively. Pasqualino embodies a healthy mix of maverick hotshot pilot swagger and juvenile naivete, while Ben Cotton slips into the short tempered crotchety grease monkey role nicely. As characters, they're quite close to some very typical archetypes, but both actors have enough charisma and the writing is strong enough to make it work. They also have the benefit of encountering a plethora of memorable one off supporting characters. Perhaps Blood and Chrome suffers from being a little too traditional as a sci fi action adventure flick. It retains many hallmarks of Battlestar Galactica, like the grounded technology and handheld shooting style, but whereas BSG felt bold and surprising with its story choices, Blood and Chrome is much more familiar. That's not to say that familiarity detracts from the film, though. Blood and Chrome is packed with thrilling action and spectacular effects. The characters are compelling and the performances are strong across the board. If one wishes to see some fast paced Battlestar Galactica action, then Blood and Chrome has it in spades. But it's difficult to see what would have made a Blood and Chrome series all that special. Ultimately, like Caprica, it amounts to a curiosity. Both projects were well produced, but neither of them really lived up to their predecessor. It's honestly quite difficult to gauge how successful Blood and Chrome was, and part of this is due to how it was released. These days, a web series with such a recognizable brand name would naturally debut on a premium streaming platform. However, in 2012, Netflix was yet to dominate this space with its own original programming. Even so, a direct to YouTube release through Machinima stands out as being quite an odd move. It's highly likely this release strategy hurt Blood and Chrome's chances of being picked up for a series. Even with high viewership upon release, YouTube video views and TV ratings aren't mutually exclusive. 2.5 million views would be considered solid ratings for a basic cable channel, but on YouTube, the return on investment isn't nearly as high, especially considering Blood and Chrome's budget. By the time Blood and Chrome did air on sci fi, it attracted only 1.14 million viewers, likely because the target audience had already watched it online. Even with decent home video sales, it wasn't enough to convince sci fi to order a full series. Although the reimagined Battlestar Galactica universe would later be revisited in the excellent strategy game Deadlock, Blood and Chrome unfortunately marked the end of this era of the franchise on the small screen. However, at the time of writing, a new Battlestar Galactica series is currently in active development. While I, like many others, have grown tired of oversaturation of long running multimedia franchises, Battlestar Galactica is markedly different. 
I'm someone who grew up watching the original Battlestar Galactica series reruns, and watched the reboot series as a teenager. Because of how strikingly different both shows are, it actually makes the prospect of another reboot partly exciting. The 2003 reimagined version has set the precedent that anything goes. Long established characters can return in any form, or be joined by fresh new characters. The relationships between them can be reinterpreted in any number of radical new ways. Tonally, Galactica is free to swing wildly between operatic adventure and gritty military drama. While other franchises end up growing stale, Battlestar Galactica has the license to be as original and bold as it wants to be. In some ways, it has become the modern version of the myths which inspired it, constantly retold and revised from generation to generation. I've thoroughly enjoyed both versions of the mythos we've had thus far, and I look forward to seeing what else comes in the future. There may yet be new destinations for the Battlestar Galactica and its ragtag fugitive fleet to find. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and share to stay up to date on all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, jump over to my Patreon where you can see videos early, uncut, and ad free. Speaking of which, I'd like to say thank you to all of my patrons and members now appearing on screen, with an ultra thanks to Stacked, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Will Martin, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and Kajing G. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.